In Iceland, there is a glacier, Snæfellsjökull, that is famous for its mystical beauty. On June 21st, 1991, a group of friends from a local Lions Club were hosting visiting club members on a trip to the top of the glacier to celebrate the summer solstice. Jonsmessenot is the longest day of summer. The entire night is daylight. In the morning, there's a special light from the sun which is cast upon the glacier when you see it coming up at the West Fjords. There are many people who say that there's a strong power coming from the glacier and that they feel this power. Among those ferrying people up the glacier that day was Oliver Rokulsson. Those of us who are experienced in traveling on this glacier should have known that there could be fissures in the area because we didn't go far enough north on the glacier. After making several trips up, 41-year-old Snabjorn Christopherson returned to pick up his wife, Christine Karlsdottir. I've known Snabjorn since I was just a kid. We were born and raised here in the area. I passed Snabjorn and Christine on their snowmobile. They were heading upwards. I didn't think there was any danger ahead. But then again, the accidents don't give any warning. Suddenly I hear the girl say, the snowmobile ahead of us has disappeared. I immediately thought that they had gone into a fissure. Hello! Hello! Some of the fissures are so deep that you can't see the bottom. You just see down into darkness. And that's a frightening sight. Hello! Stay good! Bjorgul Rubiorsen was passing the scene of the accident. These are people who are my neighbors. I know them very well. I had to stretch over the edge to see Snæbjörn. When I was able to speak to them, I felt better at first. But then, when I spoke to them some more, I realized how badly injured they were. The Coast Guard was called, and the local Icelandic National Life-Saving Rescue Unit was dispatched along with a U.S. Air Force helicopter from the nearest NATO base. It was obvious that Christine would not fall further down the fissure. But we were deeply concerned about Snæbjörn because we had no idea what his circumstances were. Snæbjörn immediately said, help Kristin, I'm not injured, get her up, help her please. I was worried because it's very cold down in the fissures. Water was seeping down the walls and the clothes got wet. She had her back to the ice wall. She said she was about to lose consciousness. I was afraid that time would not be in her favor, that she wouldn't make it. We decided to pull Christine up, up to the edge. 
It had only a small rope, which we'd had on board one of the snowmobiles. Captain, we'll get the hoot! Yeah, that's it, like it's One can always wonder whether this was the right decision or the wrong one. But this is what we decided at the time. And we did it. We kept it. Kjalmar Christensen was the first member of the local volunteer rescue team to arrive. I had no time to put on any protective clothing when I received the call. Her arms were being pulled upwards and the rope was sliding up on her. So we were very much afraid that she would fall out of the loop. The only thing we could do was get her out of there immediately. I knew Christine from before because we were neighbors at one time. I remember Christine babysitting me when I was a kid. She was very tired at this point and her body was limp. There was so much ice that it was difficult to get her over the edge the last couple of meters without hurting her more. This is a small population. Everyone knows everyone. So it was a shock to see them in this terrible condition. Dr. Gudmundur Karl Snabjornsson was at his home when he was notified of the accident. When he stands up on a glacier, a uh, huge one. You feel so uh, helpless. You can do so little when I meet these forces on nature. We realized that Snibjorn had to be badly injured, although he was saying he was in good shape. We knew from experience that Snibjorn never complains about anything. He was partly conscious, partly not. When I touched his legs, he couldn't feel my touch. I felt it would be wrong to move him without getting a doctor down there to prepare for the lift, because I thought he could be paralyzed. The only thing to do was to go down the fissure and uh, see in what condition he was. It was um, kind of frightening. It's a um, very deep one. He told me, I have never gone down into a fissure before. And the rescue team member guided him, and he did exactly as he was told. When I came down to the bottom where Snipen was lying, I sank in the snow. It was so soft, you, you didn't know whether you were going to go down through it or not. If he hadn't had any uh, spinal uh, fractures, he at least had a blow on his spine, so he was uh, numbed down. It was absolutely necessary to immobilize the spine and, and neck head. You have to move very, very slowly, step by step, and everything had to be synchronized. There were different groups taking each drop, different group with the, with the legs, different group with uh, this part of the body. It was, in fact, uh, the most difficult thing physically I've ever been in. I do not train such things daily. And then I recognized the helicopter. It was a large NATO helicopter, very sophisticated and well equipped in every respect. And I knew that would help the situation. It took more than four and a half hours to get both victims out of the fissure and over to the helicopter landing area. 
there was an American doctor who came with the captor and took care of uh, Christine. Snipe was badly hurt. I was uh, concerned about his blood pressure. Put some fluids in. I wasn't sure, uh, not a minute, the whole trip, that he was going to survive. The victims were flown 60 miles to the nearest hospital. Snagjörn had suffered severe head trauma, multiple fractures and internal injuries, and was in critical condition. He was placed in a drug-induced coma for more than a month. His wife, Christine, underwent surgery to repair a dislocated hip and broken leg. I didn't get to see him until five weeks later. I had the gut feeling that he was so swollen and looked so terrible that I'm not sure they trusted me to see him like that. If I fell asleep, I got nightmares. I feared every night, afraid to fall asleep. The fear was that he could die. He could leave. Of course, it was frightening, and it was hard to accept the fact that Snybjorn was kept in a coma and unconscious for weeks on end. This was a very discouraging period. But of course, we were that much happier when he opened his eyes and came back to life. I was very happy to see him. But I also remember when he began to talk, he said, Stina, I can't sing for you, because his voice was missing. Snappy loves music, loves to sing. I told him that this would heal like everything else. I slept for five weeks. I didn't know anything, and I had no pain until I left intensive care to go to the regular ward. I feel that I wasn't suffering much compared to what she had to go through. In the four years since the accident, Christine and Snabjörn have recovered enough to resume their lives. It was a rescue miracle that took place. Hjalmar made the right decision by refusing to have me towed up until a doctor had seen me and prepared me. I can sing a little now. And in fact, I gave in to pressure to participate in the church choir with my wife two years after we came back home. <laughs> They're not uh, totally recovered, absolutely not. But uh, from the start, I didn't think even that they would survive, at least not Snagjörn. In my view, it's a uh, very happy ending. We've been together more than half our lives, and she is everything to me. Snagjörn's Jokuls has a special place in my heart, too. Perhaps it is the mysticism of the glacier that saved our lives. Perhaps it gives us courage.